The city is probably the oldest, most enduring invention of our civilization. The words are interchangeable. Civilization, civil, civic, city. Cities evolve over time. They respond to crises. And historically, they emerge from crises stronger than ever before. So what are the future trends for cities? And what are the lessons of history? Privilege and a pleasure to present to you and, and participate with the Norman Foster Foundation to think about the role of healthy buildings and how they influence our collective health now and going forward. My name is Joe Allen. I'm an associate professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where I direct the Healthy Buildings Program, and I co-authored a book, Healthy Buildings. My expertise and background is really in exposure and risk science and worker health and safety. And for decades before being at Harvard, I was a consultant doing forensic investigations of sick buildings. So cancer clusters in offices or disease outbreaks in hospitals or in schools. And doing all that work, you realize that many of our buildings are not performing the way they need to be performing. They're not, they're not designed or operated in many cases in a way that's promoting health. And we're spending too much time chasing sick buildings. Rather than just designing and operating buildings to be healthy right from the start. So let me first start by asking you a question or thinking about this 90%. Why are we ignoring the 90%? We spend 90% of our time indoors. We are an indoor species. One way to think about this is to turn this into how many years of your life you've spent indoors or what is your indoor age? So take your age and multiply it by 0.9. That's how many years you've lived indoors. So I'm 45 years old. My indoor age is 40. I've spent 40 years inside my home, schools, offices, airplanes, cars, restaurants. When we think about it this way, it becomes obvious that the indoor environment has an outsized impact on our health. But now let me ask you to think about how you know what you know about healthy living. If I was to ask you what constitutes a healthy lifestyle, I'm certain you would say things like, I need to exercise today. You would say, I need to eat healthy. You would likely say, well, I know outdoor air pollution is bad for me. You would also say cigarette smoking is unhealthy. So how do we know these things really? Well, it turns out that much of our knowledge about healthy living comes from these great human epidemiological cohort studies like the Nurses' Health Study, or the Framingham Heart Study, or the famous Harvard Six Cities Outdoor Air Pollution Study. Now, all of these studies have some similarities. They follow tens of thousands of people over long periods of time, tracking their exposures to, thing like, to things like smoke, cigarette smoke, or outdoor air pollution, and then they see what happens to them in terms of their health. And we've learned a lot through this method, but there's something else these studies all share, a feature they all share, and that is very few, if any, talk about the indoor environment. They don't study the places where we live, work, learn, play, pray, and heal. And so our understanding of the, how the indoor environment influences our health is quite limited relative to these other things we know about healthy living. It is a glaring hole in our understanding of what it means to live a healthy life despite the fact that we spend 90% of our time indoors and we are an indoor species. Now, right now in this time, as we think about the pandemic that, is, that has hit the world, buildings are also playing a key role here. In fact, we've long known that buildings can either make us sick or keep us healthy. We have examples of outbreaks from, actually from prior outbreaks like SARS-1 or MERS, and influenza, that how the building operates can influence the spread of disease. In fact, the first SARS was seated by one person in one hotel on one floor of a hotel on one day. And, the, and then they infected many others who went on to back to their home countries and seeded this global outbreak. Well, it was about a year ago, December 2019, I wrote an editorial with a colleague of mine talking about Harnessing the Power of Healthy Buildings Research to Advance Health for All. And in that article, 
We talked about the power of buildings in future pandemics. That was December, 2019. We did not know 2020 would be the year this pandemic hit, but certainly it was never a question of if a pandemic would come. It was a matter of when. We narrowly missed three other pandemics just in the past 20 years. And when it hit, we knew buildings would play a central role. And so in late January, February, March, and ever since, we've been writing articles about how buildings should be the first line of defense against this novel coronavirus. It travels through the air. And when we talk, cough, or breathe, we emit a continuum of particles, respiratory aerosols, that contain this virus if you're infectious. Well, these particles will travel well beyond two meters or six feet, and they will stay in the air indoors for 30 minutes or several hours until something happens where the building intervenes. We dilute these respiratory particles in the air through ventilation, or we clean them out of the air through filtration. And so we've been recommending this as a strategy for healthy buildings, bring in more outdoor air ventilation, increase the level of filtration on all recirculated air to MERV 13 filters or higher, M-E-R-V, MERV 13 filters. Third, you can supplement this with portable air cleaning technologies that use HEPA filter. And we know when these controls are in place, including other controls like masking and distancing, social distancing, we can really minimize the spread of disease. But there's a problem here. Most buildings are not bringing in enough outdoor air to control this virus, the spread of this virus. And that is because the ventilation rates in all of our buildings, or most of our buildings globally, are set by a standard setting body that has targeted an acceptable ventilation rate for indoor air quality. That's the word they choose in their standard, acceptable. It's not a healthy indoor air quality standard. It's not an optimal air quality standard. It's an acceptable level, a bare minimum. So we've ventilated our buildings for decades to this bare minimum, despite 40 years of scientific evidence showing that higher ventilation rates lead to improvements or reductions in infectious disease transmission, fewer missed work days, fewer missed school days. Now, if you look back in history of when this change happened, it happened right about the late 1970s, coinciding with the global energy crisis. And in response, we started tightening up our building envelopes, choking them off from outdoor air. Prior to that, the early 1900s, we had higher ventilation rates. We brought in more outdoor air. We designed ventilation rates based on infectious disease transmission. And I know Norman Foster has been a pioneer here, talking about in the 60s and 70s, this idea of buildings that breathe. It's obvious and intuitive, but somehow we've lost our way over the past 40 years, and that has ushered in the sick building era, which is where we find ourselves now. And thinking about beyond COVID-19 or what else matters in a building beyond infectious disease transmission. Well, my team released a report we call the nine foundations of a healthy building. And so two of these are really quite relevant for infectious disease. We're talking about ventilation and air quality. But there are other factors that really matter. Acoustics, lighting and views, biophilic design, safety and security, thermal conditions in the space. It also matters what materials we choose and put into our buildings. So we really need to start thinking about healthy buildings holistically. And as people right now are very aware of this novel coronavirus, their expectations are changing about what constitutes a healthy building. And these, the thinking is that it goes beyond infectious disease. People will start demanding that all of these aspects of a healthy building are met. And it really has to do with a change in how we think about health. The old definition of health, disease avoidance, is a starting point, but it's not everything. We have to think about health promotion. Now, with a pandemic happening, we are all thinking about disease avoidance, but that's not just everything we have to think about when it comes to health. We must think about the ways that we can leverage our indoor environments to promote good health and well-being. One of the studies we did to look at this was the study we call the COG-FX study. 
looking at the impact of buildings on worker cognitive function. And in the first study we did, we had knowledge workers come and spend two weeks with us in an office environment. They did their normal work routine, but at the end of the day, we administered a cognitive function test, an hour and a half long cognitive function test. What they didn't know was that during the day, we changed the air they were breathing in very subtle ways. We increased the ventilation rate from these bare minimums. We lowered the carbon dioxide concentration and we removed common chemicals, VOCs. And when we do this, we find quite shocking results that across nine cognitive function domains, people who spend time in this optimized indoor environment perform better than when they were in a conventional space, right? Not across domains that you will instantly recognize are relevant for good health, good thinking, and pro worker productivity in an office. Their ability to seek out information and use it well. Their ability to respond to crises during these cognitive tests. The breadth of their strategic approach. Their overall activity levels. And this was a double-blinded study. They weren't aware of what we were doing. Neither were the analysts who were analyzing the data. And the simple take home message is that just simply changing a few factors related to the air quality in a building led to dramatic improvements in higher order decision making performance or cognitive function, which has obvious connections to worker productivity and health. Now, we get asked this question often what does this all cost? And so we actually quantified this. We set out to do a study. We looked at buildings across the United States, representing all different climate zones and building archetypes. We find that the cost to double the ventilation rate from these acceptable minimums into a healthy optimum costs on the order of 14 to 40 US dollars per person per year. If you use energy efficient technologies, this can be driven down to a few dollars per person per year, US dollars. Now, what about the benefit? Because very often the conversation stops there. Some will say, well, that's a cost. I'm not gonna do it. Well, we modeled out the benefits just from our cognitive function study. And we estimate the benefits are on the order of six to 7,000 US dollars per person per year against a cost of tens of dollars per person per year. Several orders of magnitude benefit relative to cost. This is a gross underestimate of the benefit because it doesn't even include what the other studies have shown about the benefits of higher ventilation rates. Fewer missed work days, fewer sick days, lower infectious disease transmission. Any way you cut this, the benefits far exceed the cost when we think about healthy buildings. We all, we just, what's been ignored is that we haven't always included the human health and productivity benefits in our cost benefit analysis related to buildings. Now, I did a, uh, wrote a book with a colleague at Harvard Business School, John McCumber, it's called Healthy Buildings. We've done a podcast for Harvard Business Review ask, answering this question, is the healthiest building in the world worth the rent? Well, the answer there is unequivocally yes. We've shown that through that study, we've shown this empirically, we show that the cost for healthy building improvements are trivial when human health benefits are included. And I'd argue that it's actually the wrong way to think about it. Healthy buildings aren't expensive. Sick buildings are expensive. People get sick in your building, that's expensive. One, it's a human health cost. Two, it's impacting your brand, your ability to recruit, retain top talent. So it's sick buildings that are actually expensive. And we make the case in this book, walking through actual companies to look at their balance sheets to say, what is the impact of their decisions on their buildings relative to the health and productivity performance of their workers? Now we've extended this and we wrote a Harvard Business School case study called A Tower for the People. It's about a building, 425 Park Avenue in New York City. And we chose the name A Tower for the People because it actually is a Norman Foster design building. And we chose the name from a quote he gave about this building. He says, our aim is to create an exceptional building, both of its time and timeliness, timeless, as well as being respectful of its context and celebrate modernist neighbors, a tower that is for the city and for the people that will work in it, setting a new standard for office design and providing an enduring landmark that benefits its world famous location. It is a tower for the people who live and work in that building. 
So Norman Foster was thinking about this and he has, of course, through his whole career, is that how do we design buildings for people? Which is crazy to even have to say that. We need to get back to designing buildings for people. I wanna conclude by just thinking about these global mega changes that are shaping our world and show that the decisions we're making regarding our buildings are shaping our collective health, as I mentioned in the opening. This crisis isn't the only crisis we're facing. We're facing the crisis of a changing climate. Buildings are playing a central role here as well. They consume 40% of global energy. Global energy is dominated by fossil fuel combustion. When we combust fossil fuel, we release air pollutants that have an immediate health impact and climate changing gases. We also have other mega cha changes shaping us. Massive population growth. Rapid urbanization. For the first time in history, more people live in cities than do not. We have the changing nature of our relationship with work and home and the blurring of lines of work from home. New technology, the merging of smart buildings with healthy buildings and changing values as companies start to think beyond their shareholders as their stakeholder group. It's a wider thinking of stakeholders. And of course, a changing definition of health where it's not just that disease avoidance I mentioned, but also health promotion. So I'll end with a, another quote actually from Norman. We got to be friends over the past couple of years and I was grateful to visit his office in, um, in London. Uh, and then he sent me a letter where he said, you know, we need a new generation of humanitarian design ideas underpinned by scientific research. I agree with him fully, the humanitarian design ideas. And I love that he added underpinned by scientific research. When we're talking about health of people, there cannot be any cutting of corners, right? We have to follow the science and start designing buildings around all nine foundations of a healthy building to promote the health of people in all of these places where we're spending the vast majority of our time. So thank you for inviting me to present. And I'm looking forward to continued conversations on how we bring this healthy buildings movement to all. Thank you.